Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So before we get into today's video, I just wanted to go ahead and give a huge shout out to my patrons, Diane, Sally, Jewel, Otterpop, Shannon, and Chelsea. I wanted to thank you guys so much. I truly can't put into words how much I appreciate each and every one of you being here for me and supporting my channel. So again, thank you so, so very much for your support. So the case that I have for you guys today is yet another very disturbing case, and it does involve the world of online dating, but it's a case that that we can learn from and hopefully use to keep ourselves and our loved ones safe. As always, I won't tolerate any sort of hate or negativity towards the victim. So many people are involved in the world of online dating and I was at one point too and it can be very, very difficult. I get a lot of comments in other videos when I make these kind of disclaimers saying, oh, so we can't use what they do to learn from ourselves and we can't use their mistakes as ways to keep ourselves safer. And obviously that's not what I mean. What I'm talking about is negative comments towards the victim. That's pretty black and white and it won't be tolerated here on my channel. My purpose for covering any solved case on this channel is so that we can learn from the case and we can share information and advocate for the victims and their stories. So again, I will not tolerate any hate or negativity towards the victim in this case. So with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the murder of Sydney Loof. Sydney Irene Loof was born August 21st, 1993 to her parents, George and Susie Loof in the town of Arcadia, Nebraska. She spent the first seven years of her life growing up there before moving to Neely. She had a big brother named Levi and a younger sister named Mackenzie. Growing up, she was described as a tomboy who loved being outdoors. She loved sledding in the winter, swinging on the tree swing, riding her bike to the pool with her siblings in the summer, and she loved fishing. According to her mom, she could outfish most of her family. They often went fishing when they went on vacation in Valentine or Sioux Falls in South Dakota. She also always wanted to tag along on the fishing trips that her father and her brother went on. Her brother went on to say that whenever he would start liking something, she would like that same thing too. She was also very athletic in her childhood years. She was on the junior high basketball team being described as a great baseline jumper. She also loved golfing and excelled in that sport as well. However, as she got older, she developed a scoliosis, which made it very painful to participate in basically any sport. So when she reached her teenage years, she was no longer as active in sports as she was when she was growing up. Sydney was also incredibly close with her siblings. Every Christmas Eve, Sydney would go and sleep in her big brother's room until her younger sister started joining them and it became their Christmas tradition. Kenzie and her spent so much time together that they actually had a lot of mutual friends, so they'd often drive around the town together and hang out at different friends' houses. Sydney went on to graduate from Neely Oakdale High School before working as a cashier at Menards in Northfolk for two years. She then transferred to another Menards in Lincoln so that she could be closer to her siblings who also had moved there. Even as adults, Sydney maintained her close bond with her siblings. Kenzie would often come over to watch Netflix, make dinner, and Kenzie would help Sydney tidy up her place because Sydney hated cleaning. She could also depend on her brother to come and get her and help her out anytime she had car issues. She also had a cat named Mimsy, who she had for about four years, and she absolutely adored him. She raised him since he was a kitten, and the two were so attached to one another. Now, Sydney did face her own internal struggles with depression and anxiety, but this did not stop her from being a truly giving and kind-hearted person. There were three occasions that her parents were called where Sydney helped people who were down on their luck by letting them come and stay at her place while they worked through their own issues. One person in particular was one of her coworkers from Menards. She let him stay with her, helped him find his own apartment, and taught him how to save money and take care of himself until he found his own place. She truly cared about others even more than she cared about herself. So on November 15th, 2017, 24-year-old Sydney decided to go out on a date with another woman named Amber, who she had met through Tinder. She had already previously met this woman on November 14th, so this date on November 15th would have been their second date. She was so, so excited about this new girl that she had started dating, even texting a friend after the first date to say, 
I just got done chilling with a super cute girl. But even though Sydney was really excited for this day, she had had past issues with meeting girls through Tinder. She had past experiences where the girl that she was meeting through Tinder wanted Sydney to join with, you know, the girl and her man who the girl was with. But this was not something that Sydney was into, so she was cautious. She had even texted a friend before the date saying, I hope she doesn't have a boyfriend. I didn't ask. So before going on the second date, Sydney had messaged Audrey through Tinder to say, it's just gonna be me and you, right? And Audrey replied with, okay, yes, of course. So she posted a selfie online to Snapchat with the caption, ready for my date. However, by November 16th, 2017, so a day after this date, Sydney did not show up for her work shift at Menards. When she didn't show up for her shift, her coworkers immediately knew that something had to be wrong. Sydney was responsible. She would never no call no show into work. Their concerns grew even more when they tried contacting her via phone calls and texts and she just didn't answer. This was very out of character for her. So the coworkers contacted her family and they realized that she wasn't answering them either. So right away, her parents reported Sydney missing to the Lincoln police. So the first thing that police did was to go over to Sydney's apartment to see if anything looked out of place and nothing did. Everything seemed orderly and in place and there was no sign of a struggle. They then went ahead and looked at her digital records and they found out that the last thing that she had posted online was this selfie to Snapchat saying that she was ready for a date. Police did immediately find this as a red flag, the fact that she went out on a date the night before and just didn't return home but for the time being, they didn't have much more to go off of. But still, right off the bat, police knew that Sydney probably was in danger. Susie, Sydney's mom, posted to Facebook to say, please continue sharing, posting, searching, and praying. We need Sydney to come home soon and safe. Police also went ahead and shared pictures of her and information about her case. And they also said that she had a distinctive walk because of her severe scoliosis. And they showed pictures of her distinctive tattoos. One tattoo said, everything will be wonderful someday. And then she had a yin yang sign. As time passed with no answers in the case, the FBI soon got involved to help. They were soon able to gain access to her cell phone records and her Tinder account, which did show that she had been messaging back and forth with this girl named Audrey and shown that they had gone on a date together. They were then able to track her cell phone pings, which showed that her phone last pinged in an area about 40 miles south of Lincoln in a small town called Wilbur. They were able to eventually track down her exact location as being at the home of a 24-year-old woman named Bailey Boswell, who was the woman she actually went on a date with. Then Bailey had a roommate, 51-year-old Aubrey Trail. So this is a bit confusing just because of the names. Bailey is the female, the one who had her name under Audrey on Tinder. And then Aubrey is a male who at this point has nothing to do with the date or anything like that. He is just a roommate of Bailey who lives with her and probably knows something about Sydney. Now, both Bailey and Aubrey have extensive criminal records, including writing bad checks, theft, drug charges, and scams, but they did not have any sort of violent criminal history. But either way, based on the things that they had found, police put a bolo out for the both of them, naming them as persons of interest in Sydney's case. Police said, quote, Bailey Boswell and Aubrey Trail are two people that we need to speak with, and we believe that they have additional information concerning Sydney's whereabouts. When the two found out that police were looking into them as potential persons of interest, both Aubrey and Bailey posted to social media to proclaim their innocence. They posted a video to social media saying that they know that they are persons of interest, but that they didn't do anything, so they're not running from anything. Aubrey said, I'm a crook. I'm a thief. I have been all my life, but I'm not what you're trying to make me out to be. He said, we don't want to go to jail, but goddamned if we're going to stand here and be accused of doing something to someone. He said, I've never heard a female in my life, so take that for whatever the hell it's worth. In the video, Bailey did admit that she went on two dates with Sydney. She said that on the first date, the two of them drove around Lincoln and smoked marijuana before she dropped Sydney back off at home. Then she said on their second date, she provided with Sydney with 
you know, the marijuana. And again, they just drove around town and smoked weed. She said that after driving around, they went back to Bailey's house to smoke some more. And then she said after this, she dropped Sydney off at her friend's house after Sydney had asked her to. She added that she had given Sydney her phone number and then they had plans to go to the casino together where again, Bailey would provide Sydney with money to go ahead and gamble with but she said after the second date, she had not heard from Sydney. She said that she doesn't know what else to say. Both Bailey and Aubrey said that they hope that Sydney is found soon and that she's a sweet and amazing girl. They went on to say that their lives have been destroyed because of the media reports, because of the way that police are mishandling this case. Good morning, Lincoln and Omaha and probably several other places. This is Aubrey Trail and this is Bailey Boswell, I guess. Y'all also know her as Audrey. But we've spent the last few days watching ourselves being slammed and crucified in the newspapers and the news and everything else, so we thought it was time we had our say. Uh, we're not trying to defend anything. We're not trying to make you believe anything. We just feel we should get to say our side since everyone else gets to say theirs. Unlike the Lincoln Police Department and Salon County Police Department and all those folks, everything we're going to tell you, you're going to be able to pick up the phone or have a newspaper pick up the phone and very easily verify it. I am going to talk for a minute, then Bailey here is going to tell you about her two dates with Sydney, and uh, we'll go from there. The Lincoln Police Department apparently wants everyone to believe that we're hiding, that we haven't talked to them, that we're avoiding them. Actually, we've spoken to the Lincoln Police Department a couple of times. Uh, we also, through my attorney, Doug Mertz in Falls City, Nebraska, please verify, we both wrote long statements and sent to the Lincoln Police Department telling them everything we know. We also, the day before Thanksgiving, which would be the 22nd, we repeatedly called the Lincoln Police Department when they were trying to contact us. After about 10 phone calls, please have a newspaper, ask for their, they record everything. We were told to quit blowing up their phone, even though we told them, hey, do you understand that we're the people you're looking for? They said, you've called here several times. We will get back to you when we can. So that's how that went. They're telling you that they have all these leads, that Sydney was last seen in um, Wilbur and such. What they're not telling you is that we are the two people who gave them all these leads. Several other things. Um, I guess the FBI and the U.S. Marshals and all that good stuff and a lot of other people with a lot of initials that I have no idea what it means is, is investigating, looking for us or whatever. We were at our house four days ago. No one showed up. Uh, we were in Wilbur. We've been to Wilbur twice. We have a young lady with us for a week, which is Bailey's sometimes girlfriend. As we know stuff, you will know stuff because we're not cutting, editing, or anything. If we make a slip on this video and say something that you find incriminating, please let us know. You know, and you've already crucified us in the newspapers. You've already crucified us on Facebook. You know, in America, I sure thought it was a trial first, but I guess not. You've heard all of this stuff about my criminal history. All true been convicted of bad checks and forgery and all that good stuff, but never been convicted of anything like, uh, I guess I'm a person of interest on now. And oh yeah, the uh, Lincoln Police Department failed to tell you that me and Bailey do about $100,000 a year of business in antiques on uh, eBay, the antique malls in Lincoln, Omaha, all this stuff. Uh, they, they will have you believe that I'm still just a criminal running around. Uh, but, you know, I don't really need to explain all of that because as far as I know, I'm not wanted for anything. I'm a person of interest, and I'm not really running from anything. I mean, naturally, I can't go home now because my house has been swarmed, searched, and I'm being looked for. But... Uh, 
and I assume that I have a warrant out of state somewhere now, so that kind of cancels that out. So uh, this has pretty much cost me my life, and uh, I appreciate that from the Lincoln Police Department and the FBI and all those other agencies. But uh, I pray for Sydney. I hope she's found soon. Um, I wish the family the best. Uh, I'm sorry that she wasn't with you on Thanksgiving. And that's pretty much all I can say for now. Here's Bailey to tell you whatever she wants to. I'm fixing to step aside and get out of this. Thank you for listening. Hi, good morning. I'm Bailey. Audrey on Tinder and a few other names because I have warrants. But this really isn't about me. This is about Sydney. And I'm just kind of want to tell you. What I've already told the Lincoln police more than one time, I met her on a Tuesday. We drove around Lincoln, smoked weed, had a great time. We hit it off. I dropped her off at home, picked her up the next night at her house. We drove around, smoked weed again, made our way to my house where we smoked wax and shatter and I gave her a quarter ounce of some really good weed. Uh, I went to take her home, and she asked me to drop her off at a friend's house, so I did so. I gave her my number. We were planning to go to the casino that weekend. Um, I mean, I haven't heard from her since. I just... I really don't even know what else to say I've been seeing all this stuff on the news presses and the magazines and the news and I just I guess I just want the family to know that I'm truly sorry and I didn't have anything to do with this and I hope that Sydney is found very soon she is a sweet amazing girl um I don't know babe do you have anything else to say I hope also that Sydney's found soon. We wish the family the best. We're sorry you're going through this. As far as all this stuff that the police department is putting in the papers, putting on the news, what they're feeding to the media, what they want the media to know, um, there's nothing I can do about that. There's nothing she can do about that because the police department is going to do what suits them best. Yeah, I know that's coming from a criminal, so, you know, you'll believe what you will as far as the police department is concerned. But as far as I'm concerned, what they're chasing us around like dogs, I wish the family the best. I mean, no disrespect to anyone. I wish Sydney the best. But as far as the police department, fuck you. Yeah. At this point, as all of this was going on, police didn't really know where they were. They were unable to track them, but they were able eventually to get a hold of their cell phone data to track their movements, and they were located in Taney County, Missouri. Both Bailey and Aubrey were then arrested and charged with things unrelated to Sydney or her case. They were being charged in relation to a scheme where they defrauded a couple in Kansas out of $400,000 to buy some fake gold coins. They were also charged with transporting stolen goods across state lines. They'd been jumping in between states and their cell phone records proved that. They were both being held in Missouri for these charges, but for the time being, police didn't have anything else to say that these two were definitely responsible for Sydney's disappearance. Again, they were just named as persons of interest and police say that they just wanted to talk to them to find out more information about what happened that night. At this point, Sydney had been missing for two weeks and searches were continuously happening to try and find her. So now going back just a bit, when police initially found that Sydney was tracked to have last been at Bailey's apartment, they did go there to interview them, but they weren't there. As I just stated, they were in Missouri being involved in these other schemes and theft charges. But police did go ahead and speak to others who lived around the apartment complex, and they found out that Bailey and Aubrey had been living in that complex since June of 2017, so only a few months. Those around them said that the two portrayed themselves as antique dealers who were engaged. They were known to be pretty quiet, pretty much keep to themselves. They've always paid rent in cash and on time. 
Sometimes they even paid for multiple months in advance. But their landlord did notice something odd. Their landlord, who lived in the unit above them, reported that she smelled a very strong smell of bleach, so strong to the point that it made her nauseous. She also noticed that the two were running their AC unit on full blast, which was really weird because it was November, so there was really no reason for them to be running their AC that high. The landlord also confirmed to police that she did see an unknown female going into their apartment on November 15th around midday. So based on all of this information, police were able to obtain a search warrant to search their apartment unit. When they started their search, police immediately noticed the very strong smell of bleach. It was overpowering. And they noted that one of the rooms in the apartment had been meticulously cleaned. The walls were scrubbed and, you know, everything was perfectly spotless, while the rest of the apartment was very cluttered and dirty. They also said that things were kind of thrown around haphazardly and it looked as if the two had left the apartment in a hurry. Additionally, the police had found a dog leash, which stood out to them and was strange because they didn't have a dog. They also found duct tape and a sauna suit with the crotch cut out. They found zip ties, a hatchet, they found a plastic drop cloth smeared with blood, and a book on anatomy. Obviously, all of this looked very, very concerning, so police were now going off of the assumption that this might be a murder case, so police started focusing their searches on the rural areas and ponds in Wilbur. So, like I said, police were able to use Bailey and Aubrey's cell phone data to track and arrest them in Missouri, but they were also able to use this cell phone data to track their movements in the days before and after Sydney's disappearance. Police discovered that on the same day that Sydney was reported missing, Bailey had driven around 200 miles on various dirt roads in rural areas of Clay County, Nebraska. They used this data to go ahead and search around this area, and here their worst fears came to fruition. They came across a ditch in the rural area on December 4th, 2017. They looked in a ditch next to an isolated dirt road and they noticed what looked like a human arm sticking out of a trash bag. When they looked further in and around the ditch, they discovered more human remains, which were all scattered within 13 different trash bags. All of these human remains were found near roads that Bailey's cell phone had pinged from. However, they noted that not all of the remains of a human were found within these bags. The left upper arm had never been found and neither were the internal organs, including the tongue, heart, esophagus, and most of the left lung. With the remains, they also found latex gloves that were pretty much covered in blood. Of course, these remains were sent to the medical examiner for an autopsy and using the distinctive tattoos found on the body, these remains were positively identified as belonging to 24-year-old Sydney Loof. The autopsy found that her cause of death was actually strangulation. They also found a lot of defensive wounds that showed that she fought off her attacker. Additionally, they found bruising on her hands and wrists, which occurred before death, which were signs of her being restrained. Upon toxicology screening, they found that she had traces of antidepressants in her system as well as small amounts of alcohol. They said that her body had been dismembered with a thin, fine-tooth saw, such as a hacksaw. After it came out that Sydney's body had been discovered on January 3rd, Aubrey had called in to a World Herald newspaper reporter to tell him that he had information about Sydney's death, but that does not mean that he's necessarily guilty. But then after this, in just a few days before his hearing for his theft charges, he admitted responsibility for Sydney's death. He told police that he, Sydney, and two other women who were not Bailey had engaged in consensual BDSM. Then he said that the other two women had paid him $150,000 to film them in these acts. He initially admitted that he had strangled her in an act of erotic asphyxiation during consensual rough sex. He said that the whole thing got completely out of hand, that of course he accidentally killed her, so he panicked and he cut up her body and hid it so that he wouldn't get in trouble. But he maintained that Bailey had absolutely nothing to do with Sydney's death, saying that all she did was help him hide her body and then wash off the walls of the apartment with bleach. Then when police went ahead and spoke with Bailey, she also said that she had nothing to do with it. 
She said that she had actually fallen asleep on the couch while Aubrey, Sydney, and the two other women engaged in sexual relations in the bedroom without her being there. She maintained that this was all an accident and an otherwise consensual act. However, police uncovered even more evidence that showed that this probably was not true. So first of all, we know that Sydney had texted who she thought was Audrey, trying to make sure that it was only going to be the two of them and that nobody else was going to be there. She had texted her friend saying, I hope she doesn't have a boyfriend. So that already shows that Sydney did not want to participate in sexual acts with anyone other than her and not with this nasty 51 year old man. They also said that there was absolutely no evidence of anyone else besides the three of them being in that apartment at that time. Then there was more evidence that came out that showed that not only was Bailey a willing participant, but that this entire thing was a premeditated murder. So like I said, police had used their cell phone data to show their movements around the time that Sydney was known to have been murdered. They also used local surveillance video that they found based off of these cell phone pings. So one video shows both Bailey and Aubrey going into a local Home Depot just a few hours before the date at 10.35 a.m. on November 15th. They were seen on this video purchasing various items such as a hacksaw and blades, a drywall blade, plastic sheets, and a box cutting knife. They were also seen at the Aardvark Antique Mall, which is somewhere that they frequented since, like I said earlier, they told others that they were antique dealers. At this store, they purchased two two meat grinders, a hand weed cutter, and a folding saw. Cell phone records showed that Bailey's phone was also near Sydney's home just before noon on November 15th, around the same time that Sydney had been home, indicating that they had been following her. Later, Aubrey was seen on surveillance video at the North Lincoln Menard store that Sydney had been working at. Video shows him walking right past her as she walked outside to go work in the outside lumber area. He was also seen stopping to look back at her two times while Sydney was completely unaware of his existence. Then Bailey's phone was tracked back to Wilbur where she was seen on surveillance video at a Dollar General where she purchased bleach, trash bags, and laundry detergent. She then returned the next day, so November 16th, the day after the date, to buy more bleach and two bottles of Drano. She then went to yet another store called Food Mateso to buy yet another bottle of bleach, more trash bags, and a small trash can. So both of them were extradited back to Nebraska and charged with first degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and improper disposal of human remains. Aubrey pled guilty to charges of improper disposal of human remains, but not guilty on the other counts and then Bailey pled not guilty on all charges. The two were set to have their trials separately and prosecution in both cases were considering the death penalty. Although Bailey filed a motion to rule out the death penalty for her trial stating that they maintain that this death was an accident but this request was denied. So the trial for Aubrey started in June of 2019 for charges of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder and he entered the courtroom in a wheelchair. The prosecution was arguing that Bailey and Aubrey had planned out this murder for weeks. They said that they lured Sydney into their apartment with the intention of recruiting her into their cult, which we will get more into in just a minute. They said that all of this was premeditated and intentional. The defense maintained that Sydney was a willing participant in dangerous sex acts with both Bailey and Aubrey, and that she died an accidental death. So of course, the prosecution brought forward all of the digital evidence and the surveillance videos that we had just discussed. They also said that there was evidence that Sydney had been strangled with a cord. This was based on marks that were found on her body in addition to a cord that they had found in the apartment. They also found a latex glove at their apartment and it had blood on it that matched Sydney's DNA. There was also a pair of pajama pants that were found at the crime scene and there was also blood on these pajama pants which also matched to Sydney. Then the prosecution brought forward three witnesses who were women who also had experiences with both Bailey and Aubrey. These women have chosen to keep their identities anonymous. So all three of these women were in their early 20s. They all said that they first met Bailey through Tinder, but then they said that after meeting her, she later introduced all of them to Aubrey, who she described as being her sugar daddy and her boyfriend. They all said that each of these three women all met up with them separately. So the three women didn't really actually interact with each other very much, 
only really, you know, separately with Aubrey and Bailey. They said that Aubrey had given them manicures, expensive clothes, cell phones, drugs, and weekly allowances of $150 to $200. They said that in exchange for all of this, they had group sex with both Aubrey and Bailey. They were also expected to help Aubrey with their scams involving selling and stealing these antiques. But as time went on, things got really bad in these relationships, as you can pretty much expect. These women were not allowed to see or interact with other men, even though both Bailey and Aubrey were seeing other women. And then they had to ask them permission to pretty much do anything. And there were times where they were locked inside of their home or different motel rooms for extended periods of time. Then when these women were not with them, they were expected to check in with them via text message every three hours. If they were to disobey their commands or act out of line, they would be punished by things such as being forced to wear no clothes in the apartment and accept whippings. These women also said that when they would participate in sexual acts with them, Bailey liked inflicting harm on them. This is about to be very cringy, but they were also ordered to call Aubrey daddy and Bailey mommy. I feel awful and dirty just saying that. It's weird, really weird. And I cringed really hard when I read that. These women testified that both Aubrey and Bailey spoke on more than one occasion about their desire to torture and kill someone. These women said that Aubrey would describe himself as a vampire and called the women his witches who all belonged to his cult. Aubrey claimed that he had supernatural powers and said that they should all participate in killing someone with him so that they too could become real witches and gain powers such as reading minds and being able to fly. The women said that they often heard the two of them talk about how they wanted to dismember a body and said that they wanted to break someone's fingers one by one as a form of torture. One of the women actually said that Bailey and Aubrey intended on making a video of them apparently torturing and killing someone and then selling it for a million dollars, which they would all split equally among the five of them. There was even a discussion of which of these three women were going to be responsible for taking these victims. They said that the reason they wanted the women to take the victims and participate in killing them with the couple was to show their loyalty towards them. Now, these women did say though that although Aubrey had discussed killing and torturing someone, they didn't think that either of them would ever do it and they never witnessed them actually really harming someone before. So by early November of 2017, all three of these women claimed that they wanted to leave this cult. Two of them said that they left it for good and one of them was still sort of being strung along, but she really did have intentions of trying to leave. But it was after these women left that Bailey started to try and lure in other people, including Sydney, into their little cult. One of these women testified that after Sydney's murder, so on November 18th, or 19th that Bailey called her and wanted her to come to the casino with her and she did but that when they went to this casino, she got a weird vibe from their behaviors. They stopped at multiple different motels and said that she went with them on multiple drug runs and their cell phone data pretty much backs up this claim. This was around the same time that Aubrey and Bailey were traveling to different states before being located in Missouri and being arrested. The woman testified that as they were driving, both Bailey and Aubrey started to talk about going to Kearney so that they could find a victim to torture and kill someone who wouldn't be missed because apparently they messed up the first time by taking someone who had such a loving and close family with people who absolutely adored her and were desperately looking for her. She testified that Aubrey said that he wanted to watch both Bailey and the woman participate in killing this helpless victim. The woman said that she obviously didn't actually wanna partake in this, but because of this whole thing of her wanting to be obedient, she just sort of went along with it for the time being. She said that the three of them had checked into a motel and Kearney, but then she noticed on Bailey's phone that Lincoln police were actually trying to get a hold of her. Bailey explained to her that they were being harassed by police and that they were being blamed for a young woman's disappearance, but Bailey said that they had absolutely nothing to do with it. The woman said though that at this point, this was the very first time that she got really scared and she realized that they weren't just talking about killing someone. They weren't just coming up with this idea, this thing that probably would never happen. She realized that they were actually capable of it. 
She said that after this, she left the motel and went back to Omaha and did not contact them again. So during all of this, during this testimony, bringing forward evidence for the first two weeks of the trial, Aubrey sat quietly in his wheelchair. He didn't make much commotion or really any issues throughout this time. But after these women finished up with their testimony and the last witness was getting up to leave, all of a sudden, without warning, Aubrey started shouting, Bailey is innocent, I curse you all, before he slashed his own throat with a makeshift blade. He then fell out of his wheelchair to the ground with blood being visible on his neck. He appeared pale and his eyes were closed and he wasn't moving, so emergency personnel were called in to take him into an ambulance and get him treated at a hospital. Then a cleaning crew entered the courtroom to clean up blood off of anything that it got on. The jurors were quickly escorted out and so were the people that were covering the case from, you know, the news, reporters, everyone like that. After being taken to the hospital and treated for his injuries, he was there for, I believe, a day before returning back to court. Of course, after saying this, there were questions as to whether the jurors could remain neutral after witnessing him in this outburst. But the judge determined that they were still able to have a fair trial and that Aubrey can return to court in handcuffs for, quote, obvious reasons. They said that each of the jurors would be questioned in relation to this outburst and ordered that they not consider the outburst when reaching their verdict. So clearly this seemed like to be a stunt that, you know, he wanted to do to maybe get, you know, a mistrial and maybe the next trial would go differently or something like that. I don't know. I think this clearly was an attempt to try to get this trial to end and so maybe it could start over and whatever, he didn't have to face the same witnesses. I don't know. I really don't know what he was trying in all this. Clearly, he's not very mentally stable because when he returned back to the courtroom, he came back and recanted all of his previous statements. He called it all BS. He admitted that there was no video, no sexual fantasy, and that there was no one else in the room with him when all of this took place. So basically, earlier we know that he called into reporters and basically admitted that he was the one who accidentally killed Sydney and all that, but now he was saying that all of it was untrue. He did maintain though that Sydney's death was in fact an accident. He said that he uses people for money, that he used people for sex, but purposely killing someone that would be counterproductive. However, agents from the FBI testified that they found out that while Aubrey and Bailey were in jail awaiting their trials, they were passing encrypted notes back and forth, making sure that all of their stories would match up. So again, clearly if you have to figure out your story with someone and make sure they match up, you're lying. There's no reason to have to do that if both of you actually have the same story. So overall, this trial lasted a total of three weeks. During this time, Audrey had two heart attacks and a stroke while waiting in his jail cell. This just shows how stressed and worried he was, how fricked he knew that he was. But at the end of those three weeks, after less than three hours of jury deliberation, Aubrey Trial was found guilty on counts of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. He of course appealed and asked for a new trial, but the judge denied this. His sentencing hearing was in June of 2021. In his sentencing hearing, Aubrey put forth yet another story of how Sydney's murder occurred. In a statement that he read to the court, he admitted that he killed Sydney on purpose, but maintained that it was not premeditated. He said that Bailey had brought her back to their apartment because again, they both wanted to recruit her into their little cult. But he said that they totally misjudged her and that once she found out about what they were doing, Sydney freaked out. He said that he tried for 30 grueling minutes to try and calm her down, but she just wouldn't. So he feared that she would go to police and tell them about, you know, their money-making schemes and how they were doing group sex and all of the other sketchy things that they were involved with. He said that he wanted to protect his good life with Bailey and that he had no doubt that she would tell other people if he let her go. So because of this, because he apparently didn't want his secrets to be out there, he decided that the better idea would be to strangle her with an electrical cord and then dismember her body so that it would be easier to dispose. Sydney's parents were also at this hearing and they had to just sit there and listen to everything that this monster had to say. In his statement, Aubrey actually addressed her parents and said, I can't say I'm sorry because that would be an insult for what I put you through. I've done some terrible things in my life, but this is the only thing I feel regret about. But this did not change the minds of anybody 
anybody. The three-judge panel sentenced Aubrey to death by lethal injection. Judge Vicki Johnson qualified this murder as cold, calculated planning, going on to say that Miss Loof was needlessly mutilated by Mr. Trail as a part of a plan to satisfy his intellectual curiosity or his sexual desires. He demonstrates a mind totally and senselessly beret for any regard of human life. He also ended up being sentenced to 50 years for the conspiracy charge and then two years for improper disposal of human remains. The judge said that even though he acknowledged that Aubrey had a rough life growing up, he was raised in the foster care system, he was poor, and he was in and out of juvie when he was younger, the depravity of this crime outweighs those mitigating factors. So again, I don't believe any of that. I think that all of this was premeditated. I don't think that Aubrey just killed Sydney because she was gonna go tell their secrets about how they like to be freaky. I don't think any of that's true. I think that this entire thing was planned and I believe these other women who are saying that they were just curious and that they just wanted to do this because they wanted to and for no other reason. In September of 2020, Bailey was next to stand trial. Her trial was initially scheduled to be held in Wilbur, Nebraska, but she did request to have the location changed. This was because Aubrey's trial created so much media attention that she thought that it would be impossible to find a jury that could stay impartial. So this was in fact granted and her trial was moved to Lexington. In Bailey's trial, the defense said that Bailey was forced to participate in Sydney's murder by Aubrey. The defense said that Bailey had a history of physical and sexual abuse growing up, so this made her the perfect victim to be taken advantage of by Aubrey. But of course, the prosecution continued to argue that this entire thing was all planned and premeditated by the both of them. Much of the evidence brought forward in her trial was the same that they brought forward in Aubrey's trial. However, they had additional DNA evidence to show that her DNA was actually found on the latex glove that was found near Sydney's remains. Throughout this entire trial, she appeared upset and tearful, taking off her glasses to wipe away tears as they discussed Sydney's remains being found. To me, that just shows that she's very upset, not about what she did, but about the fact that she got caught. By the end of the trial, after only three and a half hours of jury deliberation, Bailey was found guilty on counts of first degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and improper disposal of human remains. As this verdict was being read, Bailey showed absolutely no emotion. Her sentencing hearing was in July of 2021, and the prosecution was also going for the death penalty in her case. But she cried and she begged for her life at the sentencing hearing, saying that she had a seven-year-old daughter who needed her, which is just mind-blowing to me that we were just now finding out about her seven-year-old daughter in her sentencing hearing. The fact that she even had a daughter in the first place is just very concerning to me. I just don't know how someone can have a daughter and still be involved in all of these very disturbing things. I do know that her daughter was staying at Bailey's mother's house during all of this, so during the trial and all of that, but I don't know what the situation was before all of this. Clearly, she didn't care much about her daughter to just not be an absolutely disgusting and depraved person. Clearly, she didn't raise her daughter because she was spending too much time with Aubrey and meeting up with these different women and being in this weird cult. But either way, Judge Peter Battalion actually did end up sentencing her to life in prison and not the death penalty. He said, quote, I could not find beyond a reasonable doubt that the state of Nebraska had met its burden of proof. Nothing in this decision diminishes the senselessness of the murder of Sydney Loof and the great pain that it's caused her family and her friends. This did really upset Sydney's family. They said that if it wasn't for Bailey luring her in, that she might still be here today. They say, and I would have to agree, that Bailey is equally, if not more guilty than Aubrey. Again, I think that Bailey going out and making this fake Tinder is exactly what lured her in. There's no way that she would have met up with them if she met Aubrey. He's disgusting, and you know, so is Bailey, but obviously she wasn't into that. She was into Bailey. So the fact that she got a lesser sentence because they couldn't meet the burden of proof, I think is ridiculous. I honestly think it's because she's a woman, which is disgusting to me that, you know, they were more easy on her because of that. Again, that's just my opinion. It's not proven, but I think the fact that there was clearly evidence that she too was involved in all of this and somehow she got a lesser sentence, I think that does show a little bit of bias. But either way, that is all of the information that I have for today's video. My heart goes out to Sydney's family. They were all clearly so, so very close to one another. I truly think that Sydney was just trying to find someone to be with. 
She was so excited to just hang out with this new girl who took advantage of her in the most deprived and disgusting way. I don't believe anything either of them have to say. This was definitely premeditated and the evidence shows that. I'm just so sad for Sydney. She was young and unfortunately she trusted the wrong people. This is really a difficult case to discuss because clearly Sydney was trying to be careful. I always say that when you're meeting new people off of dating apps that you should meet up with them in person first to make sure that they are who they say they are. I always say to let your friends know where you're going. I always say that you need to be careful when you go into someone's home. But Sydney did most of those things. She told other people that she was going on a date and she even posted it on Snapchat. She went to Bailey's house after meeting her and after making sure that she was the person in these pictures. Obviously, she didn't actually know what her real name was, but there's no reason to think that someone's just putting up a random name on Tinder, especially when you know they match their picture and everything they say online matches what they do in person. I do honestly believe that even if she didn't go to their house on that specific day, that Bailey and Aubrey would have waited until Sydney trusted Bailey enough to actually go to their house. So that's just an absolutely terrifying thing because I always say, you know, and I did the same thing, you know, don't let someone come over to your house. Don't go to their house until the third or fourth time of meeting them so you can make sure that they're not a weirdo and that they're not having weird intentions. But in this situation, I don't think that would have gone any differently, which is just so terrifying because as you guys know, I always say, you know, and I practice this too, when you're meeting someone, don't go to their house. Don't let them come to your house until, you know, the second or third or fourth time of meeting them just to make sure that, you know, they are who they say they are and they're not a weirdo. But in this situation, I don't think things would have gone differently because again, she had already met her. I don't know if they initially met in person. I do think that she picked her up, which obviously I think is not the greatest idea, but still she met her in person. The two hung out and everything went really well. So the fact that she went to her house after the second date, that's, there's no way that she could have predicted this. There's no way that she could have known. Again, I don't think that her going there on the second date or the third or fourth date would have made a difference in this case because I think that they knew what they were going to do and they were planning and they were waiting. But obviously I think you still should follow the precautions that we always talk about in these videos sharing your locations with family or trusted friends, letting your friends and family know where you're going, if you're going on a date and all of that. But I do want you all to understand that for Sydney, she was trying to be careful. Not everyone can follow these precautions and not everybody knows that it's even, you know, a thing. Not everybody is, you know, as I guess cautious and paranoid as a lot of us might be because we're into true crime. We watch it all the time. I research these cases and I know what can happen but not everybody knows that, not everybody understands that. So even though Sydney may not have followed all of these different precautions that we're always talking about, she was trying to be careful. She may not have done everything perfectly and just right, but she tried. So please, again, no judgmental comments. This isn't a case of her just going to someone's house willy-nilly after never meeting them and after having no idea what they look like. This was a case of her meeting someone knowing that they're the person that they say they are, or at least thinking that you know that, trusting them, having a great time with them, and then deciding to go to their house after they had already spent some time together. So again, she was trying to be careful and I don't wanna hear any hate comments about the choices that she made. She was such a bright young woman and she did not deserve any of this. She was just trying to find someone to hang out with, someone to have a good time with, and that's it. And she got taken advantage of, and again, she tried her best to be careful and she still got taken advantage of. Again, she didn't deserve any of this and neither did her family. So please, again, just keep her family in your thoughts. They have enough to deal with with all of this. Thank you all so much for listening to Sydney's story. I really hope that those of you who watch these videos can learn from these cases and take it to make your own precautions and take those extra steps to keep yourself and your friends and your family safe. Please do whatever you can to take those extra steps to protect yourself. I want you to be safe. I want you to return home after that date that you were so excited about. I want you to meet someone who not only makes you feel amazing, but makes you feel safe and secure. But again, don't be afraid to stand your grounds. Don't be afraid to let your date know that your friends know your location and that they know where you are and that they know who you're seeing. Don't be afraid to casually bring up, you know, oh yeah, I share my location with all my friends and I told them how excited I am to go on this date with you. Before you meet someone, don't be afraid to say, hey, 
I don't really know you that well yet. I'd prefer for my own safety if we meet in public. It's nothing against you. I just want to take the personal steps for my own safety. And if taking these precautions scares them away, then they probably didn't have the best intentions anyways. I personally know from experience that no one wants to sit here and hear you say, oh, I'm scared of you. I, you know, I'm going to take these precautions to stay safe. So obviously you want to, you know, say it in a way that's not offending towards them, you know, if you really do like this person, but just let them know, hey, like, we don't know each other very well. You don't know me. I don't know you very well. Let's meet somewhere in public. And again, if that scares them away, if that pisses them off to the point that they don't want to see you, then so be it. You didn't need them in your life anyways. So again, I know I get on my soapbox about this all the time, but please just remember that Unfortunately, people are capable of some very terrible things and the only, only, only person that you can rely on to protect you is you. So again, please just stay safe, you know, go out, live your life. Don't be paranoid. Don't, you know, look at everybody and think that they're going to hurt you, but just stay safe. Take those extra precautions, have fun, but, you know, let people know where you are. Let your friends and family know who you're seeing and let them know when you should be back. That's it. I don't think that that's too much to ask. But either way, that is where I'm going to end today's video. Thank you again for listening to Sydney's story and my little soapbox at the end. Again, I really, really hope that you take these cases, learn from them, and help keep yourself and your loved ones safe. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. I also recently just made a Facebook page. Haven't done too much on it yet. Don't really know exactly where that's going to go yet, but if you want to follow different cases and, you know, stay up to date on different videos that I make and cases that I cover, make sure you go ahead and follow the Facebook page as well. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send those suggestions to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.